Hey, hey, Jono. Hey, good day, Ross. How you going? Oh, man, I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good. I'm loving this uh, this uh, restream that we're using to do these live chats, and um, it seems to be working well. We had a couple of little bugs last week when we first oh. tried it out, and it seems like we have ironed those out. I think uh, we. Had, I think we're on top of the technical issues now. We're I on think, top of the technical uh, issues. I think everything's looking good. Look, do you have one of these? Hey, I do have one of those. There it Look is. That. The American Colony Hotel Jerusalem. We have, we, to, well, okay. we have to talk about that now that you've uh, shown them that. These are um, uh, mugs that we picked up while we were there. Um, thanks to Dave and Patty Tyler. Yep. Uh, we were in Israel at the end of May or the beginning of June and uh, on a bit of a, an adventure um, for a number of reasons. And we talked about this last week. Uh, one was to do uh, a little bit of research for the upcoming Tanakh tour and the Biblical Jordan tour, which follows directly on uh, in November, because we'd never been to Jordan before, and we wanted to make sure, you know, about a couple of things. <laughs> What's well, it's a lot better. It's a lot better to run into issues when it's just like four people as opposed yeah. to forty people, and you get to the gate and people say, "Hey, what do we do?" And you say, "I don't know. We'll figure it out as we go." So we wanted so, to try that passage throughout, and all of it worked great. Iron it out, and and it all it, it all worked absolutely fine. Um, but of course, the other reason why we were there was to do research uh, in regards to the Shapira saga, and part of that was to go to the American colony, and uh, because there's certain things about the American colony that tie into the Shapira saga, uh, one of them would be Jacob Eliyahu, and and you can talk about that. Uh, the other one would be the Moabitica scandal. Yeah. Um, and uh, anyway, this was our this was our souvenir when we were there. And it's, I'll tell you what, beautiful place. And again, thanks to Dave and Patty Tyler, set us up uh, in a room there. The the grounds uh, are beautiful, and we did oh, a few it was, videos. It was gorgeous. Yeah, it was gorgeous. Yeah, and the, the nice there. little restaurant area there, beautiful. Really, really nice. Um, the history of the American colony. Uh, so yeah. you're actually writing about this. How much do we want to get into this now? Well, we let me let me now that you mentioned it. I mean, we may as well say something because it just so happens, Jono, that today is July the seventh. Now, I guess it mm -hmm. may be the eighth for you, but for us, it's the yeah. same. Is it the eighth? Here I am in the future. Huh? Here I am in the future. It is most yeah. certainly uh, coming up to midday on the eighth of. July, but you're still in the seventh. How was the fourth yeah. of July, by the way? Oh, it was it was great. All the all the local kids came over, the grandkids. We popped yeah. fireworks. No one was injured. Okay. Uh, dogs, <laughs> were, dogs were a little bit traumatized, but uh, but it's okay. No, all but right. listen though, the seventh of July. The important thing about the seventh, and particularly in regard to the Shapira story, is hmm. that you mentioned Jacob Eliyahu. Uh, in June of 1880, so I'm going to take you back 142 years, I think that is. Mm -hmm. in, uh, in Jacob Eliyahu was a Sephardic youth who worked for Conrad Schick. He was, he was part of Conrad Schick's efforts there at the, uh, at the School of Industry. Schick was involved in all sorts of stuff. Uh, we went, as you remember, went to Christ Church and saw a couple of models that were put together by Schick in the 1800s. Let me, so let me stop there and ask you a question. So um, just so everybody knows, if you have been to Israel, obviously you've been to Jerusalem. If you've been to Jerusalem, you've been to the old city. And if you've been to the old city, then you have at least walked past, past if not have been in the Tower of David complex. It's yep. uh, right there by Jaffa Gate. You can't miss it. And uh, if you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. Well, directly opposite there on the other side of the street, is Christchurch, and I believe it's an Anglican. Uh, it originates with the Anglican denomination, and uh, you know more about the history of this place than I. But it ties in; it, it does house a couple of models, right? If only yeah. they had Lego back in the day. Yeah. But there's some, uh, 
there's some models of uh, Jerusalem uh, to scale. I mean, fascinating as to how he was able to get this so accurate. Yeah. Um, because it's not just the buildings, it's the lay of the land and the, uh, the everything about it is really interesting. But Sheik built these. I mean, it would have been a cool job. Yeah, we, we, and, can and, and, touch, we can touch a little bit on Sheik as well because, I mean... It, let's just um, do a little bit of background on that because uh, the, the, the Tower of David also, I understand, has a model uh, that he built. Yeah. Uh, we weren't able to see that one because it, the, the museum was closed for renovation or whatever at the time. But over in Christchurch, I think they had two of Sheik's um, uh, models. Is that correct? That's that's what I understand. And uh, so without going too much into Schick, Schick is a fascinating, he's known as really the first biblical scholar on the ground in the land of Israel. I mean, this is, it's really amazing, the story, what this guy was able to do, what he was able to accomplish engineering wise, architecturally, not only that, but uh, archaeologically, you know, he had permission to do a lot of work on uh, the Temple Mount. So I'm talking about some underground work and so forth. Really an amazing guy. I see a comment. Hey, James. Hey, James, James. How are you? Right. James so, is watching uh, on YouTube. That's great. G'day, mate. Yeah. And uh, so one of the things that, that we just talked about the other night, just privately, we did, uh, mm. is that Yoel Halevi, uh, Shalom mm. to Yoel if he happens to be listening. Of course, it's the middle of the night for him. But he sent a, a document, a call for papers on Schick's contributions because mm. it's rough. It's the 200th anniversary of Schick's birth. So, uh, so he, it, this is going to be very interesting. And, and one of the things that I want to do is I want to submit a paper, whether it's accepted or not, you know, I don't know, but I'm going to submit a, an academic paper. Hopefully that will be accepted and just a little bit about what I'm going to write about has to do with the Siloam inscription. Mm -hmm. That brings us to July the 7th. The interesting thing about July the 7th is there is a, a brilliant Semitic scholar by the name of Albert Soken, and uh, he's actually a Swiss guy, but Albert Soken um, wrote an article in the Journal of the German Palestine Association uh, and, and he announced on July 7th, 1880, that on June the 22nd of that year, he had received word from Conrad Schick of a new discovery in Jerusalem. The discovery, Jono, was the Siloam inscription. Now, at the mm -hmm. time, there was a lot of debate, and I, I posted about this on my academia page and on my the MosesScroll.com website, late last night, early morning hours, and I translated that letter with help from online tools uh, that he wrote, published in German, and I posted that on my websites because it's such an interesting point. At the time, he and another scholar were able to look at a, uh, a transcription that Schick sent. Basically, mm -hmm. you know, they would take, you know, they, they would make squeezes as well, but he didn't have a he calls it, he says it wasn't a favorable copy, but he was able to make out four Hebrew letters written in Paleo or Phoenician script. They didn't know anything about it. They didn't know what it said. They just knew this had to be important. Uh, so Schick announces in a letter to his friends at the German Society for Palestine uh, Exploration, hey, we found this. And he tells in a letter that it was discovered by Jacob Eliyahu, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Now, who is Jacob Eliyahu? He's a Sephardic boy. He's 16 years old. His uh, parents had moved, made Aliyah to the land of Israel. He ends up working with Shik. And the story told by Spafford, Bertha Spafford, we stayed at the American colony. Bertha mm -hmm. Spafford is the descendant, the living daughter of uh, the Spaffords who moved to Jerusalem. Go ahead. So this is the the book that you were telling me that you had just read, uh, and they actually had a copy there at the um, uh, in the bookstore of the American Colony. That book is called Our Jerusalem. It's a story Our of Jerusalem. an American family. I forget the subtitle, um, mm. but Horatio and Anna Spafford. Horatio was a well-to-do attorney in Chicago. 
the Chicago Fire of 1871. Everybody knows about the Chicago Fire. It not only did it destroy his law office, he was looking, by the way, for a way to get out of his legal career. And he was a very strong, dedicated Christian man. He wanted to put more into what he considered worthy enterprises, mm-hmm. helping the poor, supporting ministries. And he, he really wanted to get out of law, though he was very successful. But when the Chicago fire hit, it destroyed his law offices. It destroyed thousands of buildings. It was just terrific. People can look that up and read about it. But I'm, I'm writing on this subject right now. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that the Spaffords did, and again, the Spaffords ultimately moved to Israel and set up um, the their home, the American, which became the American colony in Jerusalem. Uh, but after the fire, they had put so much into helping their neighbors and and working with the misplaced and so forth that the stress had really gotten to his wife Anna. I mean, she was just exhausted. Uh, a doctor advised the family that they should go on vacation. And uh, now I'm not going to get into all the good stuff because I, I have to come back to, I have to write something, Jonah. I can't give sure. it all. Out. But <laughs> read the book. no, yeah. that's right. Um, although it might help me to practice it. But anyway, so, but the Spaffords decided that they would go on a European vacation. And, mm-hmm. and uh, the long story short, I'm going to skip past all the incredible story that I'm working mm-hmm. on right now. Ultimately, Anna and Horatio end up in Jerusalem founding the American colony. So one of the things that we wanted to do as partly for research and and partly because I've never stayed there was we wanted to stay at the American colony. And that was a great time, was it not? I mean, it really was nice. I loved it. It was a real real treat. Yeah, it absolutely was. And and again, this is where we got our our little souvenirs here, which is right. There it is. All right. Um, so we were there and the, the way that it ties in, if I can just say this is that what ends up happening is that the Spaffords end up adopting, uh, Jacob Eliyahu, who becomes Jacob Spafford. Yeah. Uh, as it turns out, he is the one who is working with Schick, who discovers, he discovers the, uh, uh, the inscription on the wall in, in Hezekiah's tunnel. So, so let me tell that story quickly, because that's Go a good story. So there were a lot of local legends. Now, re- remember, if, if some of you, I know you've gone through the tunnel with me, and that's probably one of the high points of our time together. Did you, did you enjoy that, Jonah? It, if, if it was anything in my life, Ross, it wasn't a high point. If it was a high point, I wouldn't have been complaining. I had to bend over and uh, hunch over for about 20 minutes just to get through the thing. Now, uh, for people who are coming on the tour with us, yep. don't, be, don't be concerned. No one is ever taller than me. Oh, did I tell you? By the way, I was walking through Mamilla Mall, um, <laughs> like when we were there. I think maybe it was after you guys had left. I was walking through. Yeah, it was. I was walking through Mamilla Mall, and I walked past two guys that must have been this much taller than me. Both really? Of them. They must have been. Um, they were the Anakim. They were the Anakim, or they something. were Anakim. Uh, <laughs> they they were giants in the land. I mean, they, every now and then you'll walk past. Like I'm six foot four. Every now and then I'll walk past someone who will be um, uh, noticeably taller than me. And I'm like, wow. I mean, that's uh, striking yeah. anyway. These two guys, and I think they're probably professional basketball players or something like that. Um, no one is taller than me on the tour. And uh, if you were as tall as me, having gone through Hezekiah's Tunnel, I would advise to you, not so much fun. Well, but, but, the, but for the perfect size human, such oh, as yourself. That's what I was going to say. It's designed for the perfect size human. I enjoy it. Uh, I really, it's not like I love to do it, but I know that it's such an exciting point that, you know, if we go to the city of David on the tour, which we, we are, we are doing, you know, I, I definitely will walk through with those who want to go through and and you're wading through water. But now listen, this is cleaned out now. This is in Mm. good shape. It's not lit. I mean, you have to bring a a flashlight. You have to wear flip-flops or water shoes or something. And oh, that rolling. was the other thing that happened to me. I'm yeah. walking through it. I've got flip flops on because it's it's you know there's this much water, whatever. And yeah. then one of my flip flops break. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, that makes it a little bit tough. But it's cleaned out now. But back in the 1800s, it was discovered uh, in 1838. The tunnel Hezekiah. Mm. It's called Hezekiah's Tunnel, and mm-hmm. that's because a majority of people believe 
that this is the tunnel spoken of in the biblical account where Hezekiah brings the water into the city to avoid people having to go outside the walls to get water. You don't want your water on the outside of the wall, especially if you're under a siege. So according to many accounts, there are a couple of references in the Bible where uh, people say, we think that this is it. Now, there are debates with everything. You know, people Hmm. argue whether or not it was built in Hezekiah's time. Some of the uh, newest research indicates that this was a long project. In other words, that different parts of it were constructed at different periods of time. The final Mm -hmm. breakthrough uh, many people believe it dates to uh, First Temple times to the time of Hezekiah. So I, I don't have to ruin that for anyone. I'm just saying that it's a massive tunnel. It's a long tunnel. It's and long tunnel. Uh, yeah, so now, so what? Yeah, he has, what so he he how does he discover it? So he's he's this this so initially this tunnel was was full of debris. It was full of mud and rock and all sorts of stuff. And it's got mosquitoes and malaria. It's just full oh, yeah. of it's difficult yeah. to get through, but they managed to clear enough of it out so that you can get from one yeah. to the other. Now, Go ahead. now, but at, but at the time, so the story I was getting to is Jacob Eliyahu loved archaeology, brilliant young kid, and um, and he wanted to go in this tunnel, and he talked to a friend of his. Their plan was one would start on the northern end, one would start on the southern end, and they would meet in the middle and then, you know, exit the tunnel. But Mm. local legends had all kind of superstitious, mystical beliefs. Some believed that a genie lived in there or a dragon, you know. In fact, some people confused at the time. They thought the biblical reference to the the dragon's well, a lot of people thought that was talking about this tunnel. But there was a there were a lot of, of, uh, you know, mystical. I don't know what you would call it. Just crazy beliefs about this. So he gets over the fear and he talks his buddy into doing it. So he starts on the southern end and starts going through. Now, the water is higher because of all the the rubbish that's along the floor, all the rocks and busted boulders and stones and mud. And uh, it's treacherous in the middle. Remember how it gets lower and lower? Mm. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, Yeah, you remember that well, don't you? Well, as they're walking through... Uh, going from different ends, Jacob Eliyahu stumbles. Hmm. And when he stumbles, he finds, as he's finding his way back up, now he didn't have a flashlight. At at best, he had a candle and matches. Mm -hmm. According to the story, his candle gets extinguished in the water. So he's, here he is in the dark. And listen, I can tell you, it is incredibly dark in that tunnel if you turn off your light. Oh, yeah. As he feels his way to pull himself up on the rock face, He feels, let's see, let me get my orientation. On the eastern side, he feels an indention in the rock and he can feel what seem to be scratches in the wall. And as he makes his hand around, it feels almost like a frame. So he thinks that there might be some writing on the wall. He gets out of the tunnel. Ultimately, he discovers that his friend who was coming through the north gets spooked and and leaves him. So he runs back to the school and he tells Conrad Schick, he said, I think I found an inscription on the wall. Conrad Schick immediately uh, leaves his duty, runs down to the tunnel, goes in. Sure enough, they find in the wall, it's, it's a depression. In other words, it was made in situ, meaning it's not a, uh, an inscription that was carved out in rock and then plastered to the wall or somehow affixed to the wall. They they cut into the wall, smoothed it, and wrote in Paleo Hebrew. Now this is First Temple times, right? The inscription. Initially, as I said, no one knows what it means, and there are big debates back and forth. I've read everything from the 1800s as they're trying to figure this out, and uh, ultimately, long story short, ultimately uh, they're able to, thanks to Conrad Schick's efforts working with Herman Gupta, uh, he is there because he's notified of this discovery. A lot of people don't know this. Mm -hmm. So it's there in March of uh, uh, 1881. By then, it's already a full-blown debate. But thanks to the work of Gupta, he's able to acid clean this inscription 
and uh, and take a good squeeze. And what a squeeze is is they take uh, uh, sort of a paper substance, like paper mache, you might say, and mm-hmm. wet it, and then mash it into an inscription. Uh, and then as after it dries, you pull it off and you get a reverse impression, which they then take and press into plaster and make or gypsum and make mm-hmm. a cast. Yep. And uh, so only after Guta does his work is is anybody really sure about what it says. And there are two major discoveries related to Shapira. And I've written about one of these already on my website on the Moses Scroll. Uh, dot com. And, and one is that uh, Condor, Captain Claude mm-hmm. Condor, the famous uh, English uh, scholar soldier, yep. he says that thanks to Shapira, Shapira is the one who interprets the meaning of the inscription. Mm-hmm. And the inscription basically describes the construction of the tunnel. And I'm paraphrasing, but it's only just a few lines. And it says that two teams of people, workers, were working towards one another and they met in the middle. And and so that's this inscription is sort of describing the construction of the tunnel. Shapira is the one who figured that out. Um, Mm -hmm. He's not given credit for it, uh, but I've documented that and I'm going to show that not only have I already shown it a little bit in uh, the Moses scroll, but it's going to play a front piece in, in the work that I'm doing now. The hmm. other thing that that he discovered is he read in line five, he said that it said 1,200 cubits. Mm-hmm. And every scholar in the 1800s turned against him. And, and basically, one, one scholar, by the way, said, stick with reading the Talmud, Shapira. This, let the big boys interpret this. So let me ask you something about that. What was just remind me was um, part of the uh, objection to his reading, if I remember correctly, because he read it as two hundred and one thousand. That's correct, and that's correct. And let me see if my memory serves me correctly. Let me look at something here. Mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. think it's in the book of Numbers, um, chapter three. And uh, verse 50, I think, uh, and I only have the English here. He took the money from the firstborn of the Israelites, 1,365 sanctuary shekels. And uh, I think in that particular rendering in the Hebrew, it, it mentions the hundreds before the, the, thousand. the thousands. And, and so what one of the that. objections, uh, one of the objections was that, that's not the Hebrew that we're familiar with. In other words, the, the comment was, we know the Hebrew Bible, and that's not a common practice in biblical Hebrew. And Guta actually straightens them out. He said no, and, and he goes with Shapira's reading. And by 1884, Jono, remember this is four years after the discovery, everybody said it says 1,200 cubits. Mm. But guess who never got credit for it? Mm. Shapira. Shapira is the guy that said it first. Now, let me let me ask you something else. Uh, And again, this is just off the top of my head. I may be imagining this, but if I remember correctly, I think another controversy of this particular inscription uh, was whether or not it says Hezekiah, or is it talking about uh, was it Uziah? Which which king is it referencing, and and uh, who who gets who who brings this um, translation to light? Excellent question. Uh, there's no king mentioned. There's no name mentioned. In fact, that's one of the biggest causes of dispute when people, even today, when mm-hmm. people discuss the Siloam inscription and the dating thereof. For instance, if it said Hezekiah, then you could say, oh, well, this is clearly mm-hmm. uh, Hezekiah, you know, in the Bible where it says that Hezekiah made this, this tunnel during his reign. If it said Uzziah, you could say, "Oh, well, here it is." What what Shapira Shapira proposed? Now remember, he's reading this even before the good cast is taken. Mm-hmm. We learned from Miriam Harry, his daughter. Um, that's that's her uh, pen name. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, as an author, she wrote uh, a book about, that's called "The Little Daughter of Jerusalem." She tells the story that when this inscription was discovered. 
her daddy, Moses Shapira, runs down to Siloam to Silwan, uh, which is sort of a rough neighborhood at the time. Mm. And it can still be a little bit rough, I think. But uh, but anyway, he runs down there and he starts working on this. So he's in on this from the very beginning. He and Schick were partners. He worked. He was trained in Schick's School of Industry in the 1800s. So he knew Schick. So word travels fast. You know, remember, he's married to a German, uh, Shapira mm -hmm. is. So, so there's this connection in the German Christian community in Jerusalem. Uh, but the long story short is he believes, Shapira believes, that he sees the name Uziah in part in the inscription. Now, that has not held the test of time. Uh, right. Most people would say, no, nah, he was wrong on that. I would say he's wrong on that. But I can see how he could get that because the fragmented portion that he's pulling that from, he's, he's thinking, look, I, I think this is the name Uziah. It, it was actually a pretty good proposal. It just didn't stand the test once they, let, they worked Let on me it. ask you something about that because I know little about it. So let me just um, dig a little deeper into that. You say a fragmented portion. Uh, it, my understanding is that it wasn't always fragmented until uh, until it was chiseled off the wall and taken to Turkey. What, yeah. What, yeah. Is that part of the fragmented? Is that the reason why it's fragmented? Or is no, it, uh, no, this, first of all, when Sh I'll talk about that, but when Shapira first starts to work and the other scholars, uh, mm -hmm. uh, a guy by the name of Archibald Sacy is one of the first ones to, to publish on this. He mm -hmm. happens to be in Jerusalem. Now remember Conrad Schick is well connected uh, he has friends in, in England, in Germany. He has scholarly friends all over. He's the first biblical scholar on the ground in Jerusalem, right? Remember mm -hmm. that. Schick is a big, he's important. Uh, but Archibald Sacy gets there and he wades in. Now, one of the things they discover, uh, Jono, is that on the western wall, not, not the prayer wall, on the western wall of this tunnel, directly opposite of the inscription at the time it's in situ it's mm -hmm. in the eastern wall uh, and and on the western side there's a niche cut well they believe and i think this is right that that was originally for an oil lamp to light ah. so the workers could engrave so next time you mm -hmm. have to do this one more time with me because no, no. Go, you want me to just take a picture of it? Take a photo. All right. When but, you're in there, that's fine. But uh, but directly across from it, there's a, a niche with where an oil lamp was set in the mm -hmm. you know in the the uh, the time of the monarchy when this was actually constructed. So they put the oil lamp in and they do this. Now Archibald Sacy, at the time the water level is high. This. Mm. This, uh, the bottom of the in inscription was underwater, and on the upper right where the inscription begins, there's some damage. And mm -hmm. even at the time, and there are a couple of cracks. Now, what's that caused from? Could be natural fissures uh, sure. that actually break uh, okay. and got worse over time. The other thing they're fighting at the time initially is that the uh, you, you have silicates from the water. Now, the water level was not uh, consistent. So if you mm -hmm. get a lot of rain at the, in the 1800s, the 19th century, this water, this, the bottom is so cluttered, the water level rises, and that rising water is depositing silicates in the inscription. Okay, I'm so, with you. Now, here's the other thing that we know. When Schick first finds it, he brings his candle in there. One of the things that he notices is that the, ingra the inscription is not deeply done. It, in fact, if people want to read the, the thing I just posted, Sokin's article uh, that I translated, uh, he's going to tell you that the inscription is not very deep. Give mm -hmm. you an example. The Mesha Stella, the Moabite stone, Excellent inscription, mm -hmm. very deeply engraved, you know, uh, but whoever's doing this is in crowded spaces and, you know, they're trying to scratch. It's almost like scratched into the rock, a mm -hmm. little bit deeper than it sounds when I say scratched. I'm sure they did, you know, like pow tried to scratch it in. That's rock is hard. Mm. Um, but but it, so my point being, you've, you're up against a couple of problems. One 
the letters aren't engraved deeply into the rock. Two, when Shapira's looking at it and all the early scholars, it's got a lot of deposits, a lot of silicate uh, that's mm -hmm. collected into it. Third thing that compounds the difficulty is these uh, scholars who are going in there, there's actually wax from the candle that gets in here. So when Guta arrives, he goes in. It's only 25 feet from the southern entrance on the mm -hmm. right hand side. When he first goes in with Schick to look at it, he says, you know, this has to be cleaned. There's, mm. you, we're not going to get a good squeeze. A quality squeeze unless we throw it. Yeah. it we've got to clean it. Mm. Now, it just so happens, this is 1881, that a new booklet was just published. German scholars are outstanding. They've always been outstanding. A German scholar had just published a, a little booklet on how to get a good squeeze. Really? And, and he gives this to Goethe. He goes, look, Hermann, when you go over there, Hermann Goethe, take this booklet that I just wrote and use these methods that I described. This is brand new off the press. It's published that month that he's right. going to Israel. So Goethe brings the little book, uh, and I'll give the details of that in my book. Mm -hmm. And uh, and sure enough, he, he uh, does the method which involved using acid to clean the letters. Now, get this. Archibald Sacy has already published and said, here's what it says. He, like, he, he's the first one. He wants to be the winner, so he gets mm -hmm. it out there. Condor uh, says, I think he's a little bit hasty. Mm -hmm. Because why does he say that? Because Condor and Montel, another scholar from England, they actually go in and look at this too. These all, all these guys are brilliant uh, mm. Semitic scholars, and they're looking at what Sacy came up with, and they're saying, you know, I, I don't think this is it. now. It's close. Don't don't mm -hmm. get me wrong. Sacy's brilliant as well. He's said to be one of the great linguists. Like supposedly, and I've read. I don't know if this is an exaggeration, but like he he knows like twenty languages. So he's mm. no slough. Wow. Yeah, he's, he's sharp. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but he jumps the gun. He wants to be first. And there's a trick about being first. If you're first, you have to realize that you may not be totally right because you're jumping it quickly. So uh, Condor says he thinks he's hasty. Shapira writes an article to, uh, an article to the Athenium paper. And mm -hmm. he says, you know, it, it kind of tongue in cheek. I love Shapira. He says, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, he says, uh, uh, it's amazing that Sacy is able so quickly without a good copy and with the current state of affairs in that tunnel to produce such a remarkable uh, transcription of this thing so quickly. How could he do it? I tried and failed. Guta tried and failed. Condor tried and failed. Mont and he lists them all. You know, like, so he's kind of joking around a little bit, making fun of. But Shapira uh, is, is with Guta a lot. They talk about this quite often. It actually, in fact, this is how uh, Shapira and Guta meet mm -hmm. is through their association. I just held up fragments of a leather manuscript uh, where Guta kicks off his book about Shapira's manuscript by saying, I came, we came to be acquainted with one another during my time in Jerusalem while I was working on the, the uh, not yet secured transcription of the Siloam inscription, it says Shapira came to me often and I went to his shop often. So they're coordinating. Now, the thing that's amazing is, is that Shapira and Guta both come up with the same reading. Why is that? Because they're there all the time. Sacy is coming and going. He made three trips to Jerusalem specifically to work on this. Shapira wakes up in the morning, has a Just nice breakfast, yeah. smokes his uh, hookah, and uh, and goes to see Guta <laughs> and works on it. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, so uh, the the uh, the cleaning that uh, Guta does, he uses this acid, and and what happens is 
Sacy and a few other scholars who've already published their reading, they say that the acid has damaged the stone. Now, why do they as say if, that? As if, as if the acid is dissolving uh, yeah. the, the stone wall on, on which he's applying. Why do they yeah. say that? Right? Well, here's why they said it, because they saw letters which were not truly letters because it was dirty. They were picking up uh, either. There were letters that couldn't be seen because they were filled with silicate. Mm -hmm. And there were uh, deposits on the outside of the rock, which look like, you know, you'd look at it and say, I think that's an ancient letter race or bait or whatever. And, and so some of the readings were wrong. Mm -hmm. When the cleaning took place, now Guta is really upset that Sacy has accused him of destroying uh, the Siloam inscription or damaging it. Right. So he basically says, you're being silly. The letters that you saw were not letters, my friend. So, but once it's cleaned, and by the way, Schick does a great engineering feat. He determines the level of the tunnel and says, once... Once we remove the rubbish, the rubble, uh, the, the stones and so forth, the water level will settle in below, the watermark will be below the inscription. Mm. And that was what happened. Mm -hmm. Then they were able to go in, clean it again. There were three successive cleanings. Each After each one, uh, Guta made uh, a, uh, a squeeze tried to make a gypsum cast. He did that three times until ultimately he gets the perfect one. Okay. And Condor, Condor is there when the, the uh, Aziz are going on, and he says, it's as good as it's going to get. Thanks mm. to Guta, this is it. So it's Guta. Now, if someone looks up the uh, Siloam inscription and you get a cast, if you, if you look at photos, like the Library of Congress has some really great pictures, uh, but, but what you see is the result of Guta's work, and, uh, and, and that's why. Now, remember when the Tylers and I went to London to the PEF, mm. one of mm. the things that I got to hold in my hands was the work of, of uh, Condor and Montel they made a, a squeeze and a plaster cast, and I got to touch both of those. That's you know, amazing. All this stuff is going to be in the book. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful. It, mm. Like, you know, I was almost like my heart was palpitating. This is. <laughs> yeah, I doubt oh, it. Oh, my goodness. This is incredible. One of, the most, one of the most important ancient inscriptions to ever be discovered mm. uh, ever to this mm. point. To this day. And uh, so you ask about the breaking of it. So one of the things that came up pretty early on, and this Guta was asked, should we remove it from the tunnel? And uh, Guta looked at it. I'm sure he consulted with Schick is the brilliant guy on the ground, uh, mm -hmm. architectural, uh, archaeological. Guta ultimately says no. Leave it in, in situ. Don't don't take it out. And, uh, and and he said he was afraid that it would be damaged if if you if you tried to get it out. Because remember, it's not a plaque. Not the one if you see now, if you go in there now, you'll see a model, a mm. plaque. And by the way, there's a model at the Israel Museum. When we go on tour together, uh, yeah. or on Jane, when James and I go together and we go to the Israel Museum, when you and I go to the Israel Museum, we're going to talk about this. We, we will. While, while we're just talking about that, let me interrupt you and just ask, because yep. I, I don't recall, is the model that is in the museum based upon the squeeze uh, that was available, or is it based upon now the broken? It's a bro uh, on the broken. It, 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 is it, it really? Is, is I, I think. I think it yeah. is. I, I'll double check that. You, huh. you put me on the spot. I can't remember. But I think that now if you look at what we now have, you're looking at uh, that model I need to check. Maybe someone mm. who's listening in can check. If James is still watching you, I'm sure he would know. Yeah. So he can give us a comment but, and let us know. But, but, um, but all I'm saying is that, I mean, thank goodness that these squeezes were done so accurately after applying the acid and getting a real clean uh, squeeze because, yes, so keep going. Yeah, so one of the things that happens is 
Um, again, this is it's it's dug into the rock. It's like a frame has been constructed, n- not because there's a frame around it, but because they chiseled into the rock and then smoothed it out, then wrote on top of it. Now, when uh, later, and, and I, I don't know the date off the top of my head, but it's, it's after all of the debate, after the squeezes are made, uh, this I know, uh, that someone decides they're going to remove it from the wall. So the Ottomans hire some people of the street, basically. These aren't talented archaeologists or architects or anyone who knows anything about anything. They just said, look, go dig it out. And and so uh, they go in and they chisel it out and break it into several pieces. Now, this is tragic. Not only is Remember the story of the Moabite stone, same thing. Mm. It, just I, I started to say something bad, but just idiots basically mm. destroy these ancient because they don't know what they're doing or they don't care. Mm. And and in this case, it is broken. But the pieces are then taken to put on, they put them on display in Jerusalem for a short period of time. The removed Siloam inscription. Uh, which has been now broken, is put on display in Jerusalem for a short period of time. Then it's taken to Constantinople, which was the capital of the Ottoman Empire, uh, which is now Istanbul, Turkey. Mm -hmm. It was Constantinople uh, during the Ottoman times. But now it's in Turkey, and if you recall, there have been a few attempts, quite a few over the years, where Israeli politicians, Netanyahu, other other uh, prime ministers, have tried to negotiate with uh, rulers of Turkey to say, please return this, and they and they, they don't. The, the latest uh, on on that was a number of months ago. Uh, it was the claim of um, of the president, I think, of Israel, yeah, uh, saying that he had been. I don't know if he was talking to Erdogan or uh, probably more likely whoever. Uh, holds the um, position of dealing with things like this, but there seemed to be some optimistic hope that it may be returning to Israel. And, and Turkey was very quick to say, we didn't say that. We're yeah, not doing that. Right. Uh, right. In any case, um, uh, the actual uh, uh, Salam inscription is there in, in Turkey, uh, broken. Uh, and, Unbelievable. Uh, and, and, and But isn't it amazing? Let's jump off that for a second and talk about this. Um, you mentioned, of course, the uh, the Moabite stone. Yeah, shattered into pieces. Some pieces we've never even found. There's still pieces out there in the desert of the Moabite stone. Uh, yeah. Immensely important, significant um, uh, uh, artifact that has just been destroyed by people who don't understand how how important and significant it is. Um, again, the Siloam inscription, same thing as you just described. Yeah. Uh, even the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, some of those, some some scrolls that were just uh, hidden in gardens and buried and dissolved, and we'll never know what uh, what they said. You know, I mean, there is there is scr- or, or just ripped up so that it could be sold in in pieces or whatever. That's right. Uh, they they and, thought they could get more money by dividing up certain scrolls, yeah. and, and really they just destroyed um, you know the value. They could have gotten a lot more. They just didn't know. You know, again, they didn't and, know these antiques. Antiquity thieves, basically. They didn't know or they didn't care. They just didn't appreciate the importance, the significance of uh, the artifact. And the same with the Moses scroll. The Moses scroll yep. uh, uh, comes into the light of, and then it's it's like, oh no, we don't we don't like how how dare you tell us that uh, that this is mosaic? It's different to what we have, and nothing can possibly last right. this this long, you know, down by the Dead Sea. And 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 you must be a forger, uh, a Shapira. And they did to him, as uh, as I mentioned last week, uh, what they did to uh, the chap that uh, discovered the uh, Altamira cave paintings oh, in yeah. Spain. Oh, it can't possibly look at the look at the quality of it. It can't right. be that old. Whatever, you're the forger. You did it. Stop talking. Da 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 da. Uh, fortunately, they didn't destroy those paintings. Right. In any case, um, uh, now it, it falls into the hands of people who don't truly appreciate it for what it, what it is, and now we don't know where it is. Yeah, the Moses scroll. So, uh, this yeah. is a, a a story that's told over and over again, 
Uh, but thank goodness we have the squeezes of, uh, of the Siloam inscription. We have the squeeze of the uh, Moabite stone. We have the transcriptions of the Moses scroll uh, and by which they are preserved. Ross? Yeah, uh, you're bringing up some great points. You, you know, people, um, if you wonder what any of these things said, let, talk about the Moses scroll for just a moment. People... Mm have said to me, and one of the, the scholarly arguments against uh, any chance of, of certain scholars admitting or, or suggesting that it might be authentic, the quick go-to is, we don't have the scroll. I mean, mm -hmm. we don't have the scroll. Now, in, physically, that's true. We don't have the physical 16 leather strips. We don't. Yet, now we're looking for them. But what we do have, what we do have is the transcriptions made independently by three, uh, three different groups, let's say. We had uh, partial three pages that Idan Dershowitz discovered in Germany in the Staatsbibliothek. Uh, he found three pages of Shapira's transcription of a portion of the manuscript mm. fragments a b c d and part of e not mm. all of e but but part of and and that represents two-thirds of the manuscript and what's so important about that not only is it shapira's handwritten transcription we call it the purple pages mm. because it's written in purple ink uh clearly shapira's hand and he's wrestling with what does it say? In other words, he's got these pieces. They're, they're uh, 42 columns of text mm. representing two manuscript copies in 16 leather strips. You have uh, several strips that are, um, that you have two strips of two, four strips of five columns of text, etc. And, and you got to figure out, how, once you realize, wait a minute, I've got two copies of this column, you know, so which one do I use? And, and then, then after you get that, you have to work your way through. So as he's working his way through, he's trying to figure out the order. Mm -hmm. so, so, for instance, in the Moses scroll, obviously the way it begins Ele hadeverin, these are the words, you know, whatever. So you go, oh, this looks like Deuteronomy, and it looks like Deuteronomy chapter one. It's like putting together a puzzle. You say, you say, this is the beginning, and you logically, ultimately, can put this thing in the right order. Mm -hmm. um, but, but what we have is we have Shapira's, and he gives us, he he lets us know fragment A, B, C, and D perfectly. He gives us line by line where the line breaks are. Remember, the manuscript is written in scriptio continuum, meaning there's no break between the words unless mm. there's an inner pump mm. in the middle of the text. Otherwise, you just have continuous text. At times, the Hebrew will break at the end of a line. Let's say line one, fragment one. It breaks not where the word breaks. Yeah. Mid word. Now, yeah. here's one of the things they thought in the 19th century. They hadn't seen something. They hadn't seen a document written on leather. They haven't seen a document written on leather in paleo. In fact, they didn't have any examples of paleo and leather at this time. They mm. only had paleo or Phoenician letters on lapidary, on inscriptions such as and they didn't remember he find he gets the manuscript in 1878. Siloam inscription didn't discovered until 1880. But the Meshastella, the Moabite stone, is discovered in 1868. Mm. The they they think the people who believe this is fake said whoever forged this, a lot of them thought it was Shapira, just used the example they had of the Moabite Stella. So mm. When Moabite Stella breaks words, they said that this is only known to us on stone, you know, lapidary examples. Guess what? You find the Qumran scrolls that are written in paleo, they do it too. Paleo on leather, break the word. But anyway, mm -hmm. so Shapira's transcription 
tells us where the line breaks and it's pretty complete. Hmm. Guta and Meyer, that's this story that we've told people about. This is the just, Let me just talk about that just one second, sorry to interrupt, but that's yeah. brand new, hot off, off the press. In fact, Horror Press, your publishing yep. company. Uh, and thanks again to Dave and Patty Tyler for supplying the uh, translation, first time translated from, from uh, German. How about that cover uh, from uh, Daniel Wright? And Daniel Wright, and I, lo I love that cover. And, and, uh, and you've assembled this, and it's now available. Uh, you can get it at Amazon. That's right. And, and uh, so Guta and Meyer, they split up the text. Now, remember, mm. this happens uh, the first week of July, by the way, this time in 1883, this time of year mm. in 1883, Shapira shows up at the, in Leipzig, Germany, and he goes to see his old buddy, Guta, which he knows because they work together on the Salom inscription. And he tells mm -hmm. Guta, he says, look, you got to see what I brought. Mm -hmm. Come come to the Hotel Haifa. What is it? Yeah, I got to show it to you. It's, it's this manuscript. He gives him a peek. He lets him see it. And he goes, let's go back to the hotel. So they go to the hotel at, get this, Jonah, you know what street the Hotel Haifa was on? Wasn't it on Ross Street? It is on is Ross Street. Street? <laughs> it, it, it's at the corner of Ross that. Street and Ross Place. Yeah, that's it. Ross Street and Ross Place. Uh, they go. Isn't, Ross isn't where Ross they meet? Isn't, isn't there like a square called Ross Square where they, where yeah, those two meet? Absolutely, of course there is, because it's that. ordained in the stars by heaven. It's providential that I there work in it. So they go to Ross <laughs> Ross. Meet me at yep. Ross and Ross. And, yeah. and they go to the Hotel Hoffa. They spend, this is June 30th, 1883. He goes to the room. Herman Guta goes to the room. He sees this laid out before him. And he tells, uh, he, he tells his, his Shapira, I think it's authentic. Hmm. Herman Guta then goes to get a friend of his, Edward Meyer. And he tells Edward Meyer, you're not going to believe this. Shapira just brought to Leipzig. He's at the Hotel Hoffa on Ross and Ross, right there at Ross Ross. He said, you got to come with me tomorrow, July the 1st, and look at mm -hmm. this with me because I think it's real. Edward Meyer says, he tells this in a letter. We, we cracked this code. We, we translated these letters. He, he said, or Edward Meyer tells in a letter that he laughed at Shapira. Like, oh my God, you, you believe Shapira? He's an antiquities dealer. He's, he's, it can't be authentic. How, how old do you think is it? Thousands of years old. Guta, come on. He goes the next day to the Hotel Hoffa, and he said just after, when he sees him, he goes, oh, my God, these are real. Mm. Guta then, I mean, uh, Meyer then sends a telegram to another scholar uh, by the name of uh, Adolf Ehrman, mm. and he says, you got to see this. He's in Berlin. He goes, come to the Hotel Hoffa at Ross and Ross in Leipzig. You have to see what Shapira has brought. His response in a telegram back to Meyer is, I'll be there Tuesday to cool off Shapira. He doesn't believe him. Right. He gets there the next day on Tuesday. He gets there, 1883, July the 2nd, and he says, I'll tell you what. If those aren't real, I'll eat them. I'll eat them. Mm. I'll eat them. So here you've got, now these guys are, they're young, but they all turn out to be some of the greatest scholars in biblical and Egyptology. Mm. These are brilliant linguists, Semitic scholars all. And uh, Ehrman, in fact, he turns out to be one of the greatest Egyptologists uh, ever. Mm. So Ehrman by the way, it's interesting that we should talk about this tonight. This wasn't planned, but it's mm. the week. It's the week it happened. Oh, so, is that right? Okay. Yeah, so it's perfect. So mm. Airman, by the way, Airman says, we've got to get, in order for Germany to, to snatch this, we, the Germans got beat out on the Mesha Stella. They should have had an opportunity at it, but Claremont Gano snatched it up. So, so they really want this badly, but these are young scholars. They have to get the approval of Dillman, Steinschneider, all the big dogs, 
the the senior scholars, the guys that are like my age, you know, mm. these these guys are in their late twenties, but they have to get the fifty year olds tenured scholars to accept it in order for it to be a purchase on behalf of Germany. So Airman says, look, we have letters. The reason I can say this with certainty is we have letters that say this. So Airman tells Guta and Meyer, you guys work on the transcription. I'm going back to Berlin. I'm going to meet with Lepsius. Now, Richard Lepsius is the keeper at the Staatsbibliothek in Berlin. Mm -hmm. He's like the, the, the chief librarian. And that's a, it's a big job. I mean, this guy's a genius in his own right. In fact, if you've ever heard of the Egyptian Book of the Dead, mm -hmm. Lepsius is the guy that comes up with that term, right? He's, right. he's a scholar. But Ehrman says this in his letter. He goes, listen, you know how Lepsius is. He gets skittish. So we, we've got to be careful because we don't want to spook him. So he goes to Lepsius and he write, and Ehrman is writing the boys back in Leipzig. He goes, I got him. He's, he's, he thinks it, it might be real too from what I'm telling him. He's excited, but he says, we can't tell anybody else. Well, hmm. guess what's already happened? The word's already creeping out. Because Guta and Meyer think that they've got to start working the senior scholars on their own. Lepsius is telling Airman, whatever you do, don't tell the other guys yet. Let's, let's work this. Keep it private. Hmm. Word gets out. All right. So I'm going to fast forward. So they, they schedule a meeting. Lepsius schedules a meeting where he invites these top scholars these top german semitic scholars together bring come together and we're going to see shapira's latest wares they call it meeting is scheduled in berlin for the 10th of july shapira goes he meets with lepsius beforehand now he's got an inside man in the meeting is airman Mm -hmm. Airman is the only reason we know this is because Airman sends letters later. They've already, Guta and Meyer have sent sort of a transcription, their work up to that point by way of Airman and uh, to these senior scholars in Berlin. Here's what they did, we think. They appear to have made up their mind that it's a forgery before Shapira shows up. There's a reason for that. This is 1883. In the 1870s, Shapira, right after the discovery of the Moabite stone, Shapira brought to Germany a lot of Moabite uh, statues and Moabitica, they're called. Hmm. And, and he, we believe that initially some of the initial ones were authentic. Hmm. But the Germans... They were so upset that they got beat out of the Mesha Stella that they wanted to buy whatever Shapira could find. And they mm -hmm. encouraged him, go find more. So Shapira's working through intermediaries. He's working through Arabs, namely Salim Al-Khari. And uh, he tells Salim, he said, look, the Germans want more. And he said, oh, you want more? I think I can probably find some more. Give me a few weeks. He goes back. When the next batch comes in, and meanwhile, Condor and Montel and some of these other Kitchener, some of these brilliant people from the PEF are looking in Shapira's shop. They're seeing, they're actually drawing these and mm. they think, oh my God, these are real. So, so they're sending word back to England. We think these are authentic, but the Germans make Shapira promise, please look, don't sell to anybody else. So Shapira, consider us a, consider uh, us a sure buyer. Consider we, we us a sure this. buyer. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're putting our foot down on this uh, right now. So as you point out, yep. um, Condor and, and, and a few others are giving um, are authenticating this, if you like, or giving it a stamp of authenticity and saying, right. hey, we can, here's some, here's some uh, drawings. By the way, were some of those drawings available at the PF when, when you were there? Yes, I got to I got to actually hold the the drawings that these guys sent in in the 1870s from is that Condor. Right? Condor is a brilliant artist, and mm. um, you know I'm I'm working on on this Morbidica stuff as well. 
So mm. I really believe that Condor's no idiot, and neither is Kitchener, uh, yeah. and neither is Montel. These guys are all looking at this, saying, "I think, I think these are authentic." But mm. now, now that was when you had a couple of hundred. But when Shapira puts a word out, listen, the Germans are willing to buy whatever you can find. Guess what? They find a hell of a lot more. They find fact, a whole lot more. Now we have about 1,700 of them. <laughs> 17? I didn't know that it was that many. Yeah. Now, uh, Shapira himself becomes, you know, I mean, look, it's it's his job to, um, uh, you know, to supply and to sell. That's his job. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Nevertheless, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's buyer beware. I mean, you, the buyer is responsible for making sure that what they're getting is what they're paying for. Yeah. Nevertheless, Shapira says to the Germans, if I recall correctly, hey, don't be too rash. I, I'm just letting you know, I'm not 100% sure yeah. that all of this is authentic. That's uh, right. Is that correct? That I'm, is right about absolutely that. What, correct. What does he say to them? He, he, he tells the Germans... They're they're anxious to buy, and he tells the Germans, "Listen, I won't sell anything to you until you authenticate. Have your experts authenticate it." Because he said, "I think he actually says in writing, I have his letter, a copy of his letter, obviously." But he says, uh, uh, "I I am almost certain that some of these are false, hmm. but you you have to authenticate them." I'm not mm. going to sell them to you until you tell me that you've authenticated them. They said, That's listen, right. you listen, all we're telling you, Shapira, is get more. He said, listen, all I'm telling you is I think some of them are fake. Well, the German authorities come back and they say, we want them. So he sells nearly 1,700 uh, to the Germans for 22,000 Thayers, I think it's pronounced Thayers, T H A Y E R S. Mm -hmm. uh, someone who knows that uh, might be able to correct me, but I learned the word by reading, so I apologize. Anyway, mm -hmm. it it roughly based on I went to several sites that I could find that do conversions from 1883. What is this in American dollars? And and the sites that I checked said that he he basically got 400 grand. Uh, in 2021 money, American dollars, mm -hmm. for the sale of, of 1,700 odd Moabitica. Now, guess what? A guy by the name of Claremont Gano, we know Claremont Gano. Oh, yeah. He says, this is fake. This is fake. I'm telling you, these are fake. You Germans, you should have checked with me. I'm the expert. Uh, and I'm not off of very far. I'm paraphrasing, but this is about, about what he said. You guys are idiots. You got taken. <laughs> so because they didn't do their due diligence, which Shapira urged them to do. Yep. Uh, and they and now here's a question. I don't know if you know the answer to this, but was there any negotiation going on on the price or did they literally just say, give it all to us and throw money at him and say on your way? It's basically it, that. It's basically it, it really, that. Yeah. Well, well, well no, wait, wait. Let me correct myself. They did tell him, give us your price. And he said, mm -hmm. I won't give you a price till you authenticate. They said, give us the price. We want it all. He goes, oh, okay. And we have that in writing. Yes. I won't give you a price until we. So clearly, yep. Gano, <laughs> Gano throws the egg on the Germans' faces and they're like, get this egg off my face and put it yep. on Shapira. That's this right. Is Shapira's fault, and so they blame him. Now this brings us back to uh, uh, to our souvenir, uh, the American yeah. colony, because yeah. uh, one of the reasons why we were there is because uh, there in the American colony they have an example of this Moabitica. Yeah, several uh, examples. And, yeah, and several examples. We wanted to go and have a look at that. Also, with the money that. Oh, I'm that, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. American colony has the one. You're right. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Has has the one? It has I, one. Uh, no, you're right. It has the one. Um, and uh, but with the money that Shapira got, this four hundred thousand uh, US dollars, yeah, uh, almost half a million, he goes and purchases uh, Tico House, right? That's right. And and we did go there as well. Uh, and they, and they there, had several Moabitica on display there. They had several uh, Moabitica on display, and now all of the ones that are on display are understood to be authentically false. Uh, the ones that we saw is that 
Is that fair? That's a weird way to say it. Authentically false. Yeah. That, well, in- and you have to say it like that because uh, we have to trust people like um, uh, Claude Condor and so uh, and people like that who, who uh, even went to the trouble of uh, sketching these in detail. And uh, early on in the, in the Moabitica saga, uh, as you say, when it's just a matter of one or 200, maybe you know, the, the majority of these perhaps are, uh, are actual... Uh, actually, ancient Moabite uh, pottery. Yeah. But when you get to seventeen hundred, yeah, yeah he, was like, he he you know? buys this from a very wealthy Arab. Uh, it's called the Aga Rashid place, and uh, uh-huh. and so Shapira moves into there, and and we're still trying to verify. I know Matthew Hamilton probably has uh, verified this one way or the other. In my mind, I think he's he's renting, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know that he buys the place. I, I don't know that. But it ah, was his residence. Gosh. It was his residence. Ah, uh, okay. I didn't and, know that. Uh, I, thought, I thought he had actually purchased it. Yeah, but, okay. and, and he, may, he may have, but I, I don't know that off the top of my head for sure. But, but in nonetheless, case, yeah. uh, in fact, I think in the Moses scroll, I, I lean towards the fact that he's purchased this place. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he clearly has money because of the transactions with the Germans. Mm. Now, now here's the deal. So Claremont Gano, uh, he's also a young scholar. He's also brilliant. He has just uh, done the main work on the Moabitica, uh, mm. the, the Moabite stone, the Mesha stone. In fact, yeah. what you now see, this Frankenstein-looking Moabite stone, that's replicas are in... Uh, what we have in the Israel Museum, for instance, and other places, mm. and it it's all looks piecemeal. That's because it was blown up. Now, um, guess what? Guess what? This is how this is all interconnected. Uh, Claremont Gano is working with an Arab guy to get a squeeze of the Mesha stone, the Moabite stone, the, the before it's blown up. And he hires a guy to make a drawing and they do actually get, there is one squeeze that's made, but the Arabs get mad while the squeeze is not yet dry. They rip it off and tear it in seven pieces. So it's, you got to piece it together. Now, one artist, uh, a great, a guy by the name of, get this, Salim Al-Kari. This is the same Arab that works for Shapira and, and Claremont Gano's working with him. Mm-hmm. He has seven lines uh, of the Moabite stone that he's drawn out that he gives to Claremont Gano, which is what gets Claremont Gano interested in in the first place. Mm-hmm. So, so it's, it's a small pond, as we say. Yeah. It's the same names, Claremont Gano, Salim Al-Kari, Moses Shapiro. In fact, get this. When Klein, the minister who's first shown the Moabite stone, when when he sees it for the first time, it's out on the ground. Mm-hmm. Miriam Harry says that there is this monument that her dad has unearthed. So you have to wonder, did Shapira, was he involved in unearthing the Moabite stone? Be that as it may, Once it gets blown up, you indicated earlier in our show that we don't even have some of the pieces. Mm. That is supplied. It's reconstructed by Claremont Gano. So what you see in the pieces that aren't part of the original stone, but the paleo is written, Claremont Gano did that. With the assistance of Alkari, is that what you're saying? With the assistance of Salim Alkari. I really love that. So Salim Alkari, now that... The, the suggestion may be, uh, if, if we kind of, you know, think this through, maybe Salim al Khari is like, you like these letters? These letters are worth something to you? Oh, they're yeah. worth money? Hey, yeah. hey, hey, brothers, cousins, hey, listen, they like these letters. You know, do you think that maybe we can, uh, you know. You think we can find some more we stuff? Can think- find some more. Can we, can we set up a little bit of uh, a, a factory, a, po- a, a pottery factory and find some more? Uh, yeah. And even some more and some more, uh, because uh, uh, Al-Khari uh, professes to be the one who 
can read. He he knows several languages. Yeah, Al Kari. That, that's right. It, the Arabic Kari is related to the Hebrew uh, Kore or Kara. We that and it means read. In fact, it, it's he says he has this name because he is the one who can read all these languages, as you just said. So Salim Al Kari. Now the the thing about this is in the newspaper reports from the 19th century the relationship between Shapira and Alkari is very sketchy. It's generally presented as Shapira's crooked. He's this crooked Jew. He's a, a shyster. He's a swindler. Mm -hmm. And he's working to fool the world. So he hires Salim Alkari, who's also crooked and just wants money. The, by the way, this is the way it's presented. They work together to make a lot of money. You know, Salim is good at faking stuff. Shapira turns his head and, oh, you found some more. Thank you. I'll go sell them to the Germans. But that's not what's going on here. We have every indication that Salim, in, uh, in good faith, Shapira hires Salim, who is going to get these. Shapira says, I think some of this is fake. He tells the Germans, I think some of this is fake. The Germans say, we want to buy it anyway, blah, blah, blah. Okay. In the end, when they're deemed forgeries, Shapira, the businessman, the one who is a re reputable scholar, basically, he writes uh, an article that separates himself from Salim al -Kari. In fact, we think he even had him thrown in jail at one point. Uh, is that, right? being a crook. that was, yeah. was going to be my next question because I don't know the answer to this. What became of Salim al Khari? Do we know? Yeah, we know? He, according to one report, he flees to Alexandria. Once he gets out of the slammer, he flees uh, to Alexandria, Egypt, where he was, uh, I guess, presumably from. Uh, you know, yeah. get the get the heck out of Dodge. You know, I mean, his mm -hmm. his name is ruined. Sh Shapira actually writes that he's a forger uh, and mm -hmm. publishes it. So they're, they're not happy with one another. Um, mm. But I, I don't think he just throws Salim al under the bus for no reason to get himself out of hot water because I have the letter where Shapira says, I think some of these are fake. So when they say they're fake, Shapira knows he's the one that he, it's Salim al has been dealing with. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, so the long story short is Salim goes away. But... The reputation of Shapira is connected with the Moabitica scandal. Mm -hmm. So, so what Gano Claremont Gano ultimately says in writing, uh, not only in the newspapers, but he writes a paper called uh, uh, "Genuine and False Artifacts" or something like that. Uh, I can't remember the exact title, but he, mm. he, he basically fingers Shapira, uh, but but really Salim Al Kari. Now, once this comes out, this is 1868 is when the Moabite stone is discovered. This is in 1872, April the 2nd of 1872, Shapira gets the first Moabitica. All right, so 72, you're talking just uh, a couple of years after the Moabite. This is hot. Mm. This is the next greatest thing. A, a scholar in Germany by the name of Konstantin Schlotman uh, uh, believes that these are authentic representations of a Moabite culture connected to the Moabit, the Moabitica, the Moabite stone. He's like, so he begins to publish books on it. Mm. Two other German scholars by the name of Couch and Soken. Remember Soken? Mm -hmm, Soken mm -hmm. is the guy that I just published a letter from yep. uh, announcing. So all these names all these By the way, I'm sorry to yeah. interrupt, but just so, so everybody knows, the Mosescroll.com, the Mosescroll.com, uh, Ross's blog there, and yeah. um, and the latest article that he's published is in that regard. And you'll also find it on uh, Academia. On my Academia uh, page, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. So so just just to kind of pull this together, 1868, 1872, the Moabitica start to come in. Uh, the purchases are 1875, 76, something like that. Uh, it's declared ultimately a forgery. The proverbial stuff hits the fan. You know, Claremont Gano. Everybody then says, Claremont Gano put it this way, there isn't a single one of these things that's genuine. It's all fake. He says every bit of it. And you have other people, Constantine Schlotman, 
evidently believed in this until the very end, like until the end of his days, he believed mm. that there were some authentic in the Moabitica. Mm. Uh, others seem, Condor seemingly believes that batch one is authentic. Maybe batch two was fake. I so, think so that's this, probably it. Well, this is my question. I mean, um, do do the Germans still possess this whole case of, of uh, Moabitica, right? So this is the question. And yeah. if so, uh, have they not done, I mean, the, the forensic testing that we can do these days yeah. uh, surely would, would be able to be uh, conclusive as to whether the first batch was authentic, uh, if there was any authenticity to the second, third batch. What what? What do we know about that? We know we know quite a bit, actually. Uh, there's a guy, a scholar by the name of Hyde, who wrote uh, The Moabitica and Its Aftermath, I think is the title of his paper. Mm -hmm. um, he did a really good job of determining the locations of certain surviving Moabitica. In other words, where is it all at? It sort of gets scattered around. Now, here's the deal. If, if your intention as the German government was to put it in the Staatsbibliothek or the, the Berlin Library, I mean mm -hmm. the Berlin Museum, uh, for the world to see that you're the owners of this great Moabitica mm -hmm. culture, and then it's declared a forgery, and the world is laughing at you. They say, get mm -hmm. that stuff out of here. I want it in cabinets. I want you to put it in the basement. Get it out of the museum. And that's what they did. So pieces of it end up getting scattered. Now, Dave Tyler uh, travels to Europe quite a bit, and he made some inroads um, with the uh, person over uh, the, the British, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Berlin. Berlin State Library. And one of the things that she told us on our last visit is that, believe it or not, a lot of this stuff was centrally located, documents, papers, artifacts, but when Berlin was divided, East West Berlin, she says that some of their archives are still not connected digitally or otherwise. So some of the things are in uh, what was East, some are in what was was West Berlin, and they still are trying to get all that together. Amazing. So there's no telling what's there. Trick is, and this is important, this particular person that Dave made friends with, and now I know, uh, happens to be fascinated with the story of the Moabitica, Shapira Scroll, uh, and a couple of big names in scholarship that are that are involved in the Shapira case, one being Steinschneider. So she's on our team, meaning she'll help us when we need it and, and w when we need it and what we need. Mm -hmm. When we went to the Stutz Bibliothek, we contacted her. She helped us get in and and look at certain things and, and so forth. Now, so what we've got is we do know that some of these are still out there. Hyde identifies locations of some of them. It's how you and uh, w when we went to Jerusalem, we knew that there were some at the Tico house. We knew there were some at the uh, American yeah. colony and there are others in Israel that we're going to look at. So the answer is yes, we're going to look for part of the research we're working on, I want to test the samples that we have. Are mm. any of the samples that we know of that we've identified and located, are any of those authentic? Maybe and some are. Maybe they are. Um, one of the things that was a little disappointing when we were at the American uh, colony is that they do have a museum there and uh, and it was still closed for want of, of getting sufficient staff to actually have it open uh post covid that's right uh, we, now in we're to understand that in that um a museum there is uh much more uh in as far as the moabitica is concerned to to have a look at we weren't able to get in but maybe ross when we go back in november perhaps it will be open maybe we can get in there and have a bit of a look yeah we're going to definitely make some arrangements to try to coordinate visits now and and more and more things were open when we were there there was very little that was uh still well, that's everything was open. I was surprised, yeah. but some of the things like you know this is, i mean who's going to go over there and say hey can i go look at these morbidica you know, they're, they're worried about getting the, the main things open and running and staffed. Mm. And this was sort of a, a fringe request. And, and I didn't do due diligence and get approval before. But when we go on these tours, we're going to be able to see some things 
uh, particularly related to uh, Shapira, that that will arrange. I think a lot of people would be interested in in seeing some of this. But hmm. so I, I think it's it's fascinating how all of these stories are connected. You know, I had no idea when I started the research on Shapira that there would be a connection to the Moabite stone. But but here's the thing. When the Germans back to the let's go back to July of 1883, mm -hmm. the meeting with the Germans, I can imagine I don't have solid proof of some of this, but I do know that they were still a little bit burned over the purchase of the Moabitica in the 1870s. Remember, this is only a decade later. So here you've got that case closed. Mm. Shapira is at least got fingers touching forgery. And, and he almost, he fooled, the, this is their view. He fooled the German government once. We looked stupid when the French Claremont Gano comes in and says, it's all forgeries. Yeah. Now you've got Shapira again. He's coming well, to he, well, he's he's coming to Berlin July the tenth with this manuscript. Now go. Is it is it not more the case though, Ross? Because of of everything that we've just unpacked, would it not be fairer to say that uh, they made Shapira the scapegoat because they didn't do that due diligence? They didn't investigate. They have. They have uh, the experts experts there by which Shapira was saying to them, you guys have to authenticate this stuff because I'm not convinced that this is all 100% genuine. Yeah. Uh, 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 some of this may be false. They said, yeah. shut up, take my money, right? <laughs> shut up, take yeah. my money. That's what yeah. they did. And when, when Gano said, here is the egg, put it on your face, they went, no, 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 no. Um, uh, uh, Shapira, now they made him the scapegoat. How can they possibly... How can they possibly accept? Because he's still a, uh, a, a um, uh, he's still supplying the the, the British Museum, right? He's and, still in the Berlin. He's also supplying manuscripts to the Berlin the Library. But but um, but with something so massively significant, yeah, uh, that seems fanciful. That something so old uh, on, on leather in paleo could be that, that it would last this long that we could even read any of it but and it's coming from Shapira we can't accept anything like that from him this yep. is clearly very very expensive and I'm not willing to put that amount of money on the table when we made him the scapegoat yeah we made him, and if we do that and we say hey we're very interested in this yeah. we think it's genuine we're prepared to give you a lot of money for it right um, what they're really saying is you are you you're a you're a um, a supplier whom we trust. You're 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 offering us something uh, amazing here, an option. They can't do it because they've no. already written him off. They've That's made right. him the guy. That's right. And and they go in this meeting, and Airman is there, and and several other Dillman, Sachau, um, uh, Steinschneider. I mean, these are like you can look up any of these names, Jono, and mm -hmm. you and I have. But, but when you look up these, these guys are towering giants. They're towering giants. To this day, I have books on my shelves by these guys. Mm -hmm. like these are the brilliant biblical scholars of the world. Mm. And, and they have to make a call. But like you said, for the reasons you just named, and, and they're not willing to take the chance. It is safer. I mean, they, safer. It's almost a ploy, uh, play on words there. Safer, S-E-F-E-R. Uh, is a scroll or a document uh, safer? S A F E R. It's safer to say the safer is fake, and that's what they they ultimately they don't really give him that answer though, but they say eh, you know we'll give you and they offer him a low number. We mm. know that now th this is all at the time July the tenth. All they do is tell him now. But he's outside. Sh Shapiro's not allowed in the room while they talk about this. Mm. But Airman is in the room. And we know Airman, what he said, what went on, because Airman writes a letter. Now, after the meeting, Lepsius approaches Shapira and says, uh, hey, we're willing to give you a little something. But, you know, uh, if you had planned, because Lepsius likes Shapira. He's favorable to him. He tells him, look, between us, Maybe take the scroll to uh, London. Yeah, you know, 
So he goes, okay, all right, I'm packing it up. Thank you very much. He leaves and he goes to see Airman. Now we know this because I have Airman's letters uh, mm. and not just I, but others have Airman's letters. Uh, Airman goes to, he meets with Shapiro and he says, man, look, uh, I agree. Take it and, and go. Uh, it just didn't go that well in the meeting. Uh, I mean, and now what we don't know is how much he divulged to Shapira. So Shapira leaves and goes to London, all right? That he's in July and he's he's headed to London. He's going to go to the PEF. But meanwhile, Airman writes a letter back to the boys, uh, Edward Meyer and Guta. He writes a letter to uh, Meyer and he says, I'm sorry. I, I don't know what to say, but he said, looking at that raggedy thing in there with those guys, he said, I, I tried, but, but they were just convinced and, uh, and, and they shot it down and, and having listening to all the, these are brilliant guys. Remember Jonah, these aren't just sloughs. They're like, well, the Hebrew here, we would expect to see this, this form of the verb, and we don't see it here. The spelling is deficient here. According to what the uh, uh, driver says in his uh, verbal forms book, this is clearly a forgery. And, you know, and he's mm. listening to all this, and he tries to make objections, but he's a 29-year-old scholar, and mm. the, they basically tell him, shh, we're not buying. Mm. So he writes, Airman writes to Edward Meyer and he's, he's ashamed because he, he there, remember he said, if these things are fake, I'll eat them. And he said, I didn't, I didn't know what to even say to Shapira, you know, mm. and, and I don't even know if I believe in their authenticity anymore. I'm sorry. Mm. They got the best of him. So th this is basically all people know about what took place in Germany but the Germans missed an excellent opportunity for all the reasons we've discussed and more. Mm. The story isn't over. I'm, I'm currently doing the background of all of this. We've sent, since the publication of the Moses Scroll, we have more letters that we found and we're actually translating more letters in the back and forth in the German side. I'm, See, I'm everybody, everybody that knows about Shapira, they, they mostly know what happened in London. They show mm. up and he shows up in London uh, in, on the 20th of July. You know, he knocks on the door. He walks into the PEF and meets, you know, Walter Bassant, who's the secretary of the Palestine Exploration Fund. Mm -hmm. and, and then the story kicks off. Most people know that story or they think they do. Uh, but I'm going to blow the wheels off of all this stuff. Listen, mm. not only do I think that this was the greatest oversight in all of history, but I believe that we can validate what I just said just as strongly, and I even have confidence that we're going to find the, the actual scrolls. Without the scrolls, I think we've got a solid case that mm -hmm. this is the most ancient manuscript, uh, biblical manuscript ever. I know there's some that would object to that and have objected to that, uh, but I think the evidence is too strong too uncanny the similarities between our manuscript and the story of the discovery of the Dead Sea on man. He, he so couldn't he just, have faked it. Oh, that was a little bit of a Biden quote there. Come on, man. Come on, man. Come on, man. Come Not on, a man. joke. He you just broke up a little bit there. So what, what I think you uh, just said, just to repeat for the people, is that um, uh, were you making reference to the latest find in regards to the similarities in the Dead Sea Scrolls, as opposed to the Masoretic Text, is that what you just said? Yeah, that actually the physical characteristics is what I was really highlighting. Oh, and the physical car but, characteristics. Because yeah. let me let me add this one thing: as far as the orthography, the spelling of words. So so let's take two things. If you look at the text, the Paleo script, the letter forms, eh, pretty similar between our mm. manuscript and some of these Paleo. Uh, manuscripts that we now know somewhat somewhat Jonah there are some differences that mm -hmm. that we're working on and we're trying to figure this out uh, but here's the thing even in the paleo manuscripts at Qumran the spelling is often plain or full so a lot of times you would you would have uh, uh, a word spelled in Hebrew with 
what we call vowel letters. Technically, they're consonants that have vowel power. Um, you know, a, a simple example is the the name David. Uh, in Hebrew, you you see it spelled two ways in the Hebrew Bible. You have Dalit, Beit, Dalit. That's um, that's deficient. It doesn't have a vowel in there, a vowel letter. Although we know it's pronounced David because of the way it's pointed by the Masoretes. Uh, but there's another spelling for David that we see primarily in later biblical literature, later biblical Hebrew. And it's spelled Dalit Beit Yud Dalit, David, mm. where the the letter Yud is Texas employed. Well. Yeah, but it's spelled both ways. So that's called yeah. full or plain. We see uh, in later biblical literature, by the time these vowel letters are inserted, the, the, the idea is, the uh, proposal, and I think this is right, I know this is right, the earlier you go, the less likely you are to find the, the use of vowel letters. That's a later practice. Mm -hmm. What strikes the person who reads the Moses scroll is that it is almost, uh, it's shocking because you don't see, you do see some, but not that many. And it's where you find them that's most striking. Guta talks about that in, in mm. the book, which is in English. There is, Hebrew in it, by the way, and it's academic, I'll tell people, but, uh, but he gets into some of these things that, you know, kind of surprise you like, wow, I would have, but so they originally, they thought, oh, I see what he's doing. I see. He's looking at the Moabite stone. The Moabite stone doesn't use these vowel letters. He wants it to appear to be ancient. So he gambles. The forger says, I got to fake this thing. You know, and I got to fake these guys. What am I? Perfect, perfect. I'm going to write words. I'm going to spell words like they do on the Moabite stone. And therefore, my document will have the appearance of being ancient, but it's not really ancient. I'm faking them out. And that's what he does. That's what he, they, they say he does. Mm -hmm. But we now know that, uh, that, that that's not a fake. But the reason I bring up the Dead Sea Scrolls, so the, the external characteristics of what we see in the Qumran Scrolls and mm -hmm. other, other Judean wilderness scrolls match the physical characteristics that are described about the Moses Scroll. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the everything, not only, not only the size, you know, because when they first, they said this thing is about four inches, uh, you know, in, in height and in each column is about six inches. So about four by six, each column. And, mm -hmm. and so when people, they said that we, that's not the way we, a scroll would be bigger than that. Cause they're thinking a modern Torah scroll. So Claremont Gano's theory still sticks. Most people who are uninformed accept his theory wholesale. And they say that the forger, whether they people consider it to be Shapiro or someone else, cut off the bottom of a an Torah old scroll, scroll. Yeah. and uh, and that's what they think. But now we know other manuscripts at Qumran have that same physical characteristic. Mm. Not only the same size, Leviticus. There's a Leviticus scroll that uh, that is almost exact in dimensions, and uh, and and so and the curvature of the scroll. Every mm. representation we have of Shapira's manuscript depicts it as being curved. Shlomo Gill was uh, one who pointed this out uh, in his article on, uh, uh, and that was published in the PEF. He put mm -hmm. forward the idea that the Shapira manuscript is uh, an actual Dead Sea Scroll. So he mm -hmm. kind of pioneers this. Other people do as well. Jefferson, uh, and, and even if you go back to 1956, Right. You didn't you didn't have Mansoor claiming Menaka Mansoor from Wisconsin. He doesn't claim it's authentic, but he says it deserves a new look because of what we see at the Qumran scrolls. So in December of 56, Menaka Mansoor goes to the SBL, Society of Biblical Literature, and gives a paper claiming it's called the case for Shapira's Deuteronomy Dead Sea Scroll. Mm -hmm. 
and and he's blasted. Other scholars hate this. It, it's it gets the hair on their neck to stand up. They just because it's already been declared a forgery. Let the let the dead dog lie, as they would say. Yeah. It's a horrible expression, but that's what they want to leave it alone. Don't bring this thing back up again. In 1965, John Marco Allegro publishes his book called The Shapira Affair. He believes it's authentic. Now, he's bold, and some people say he's a maverick. Uh, you know, he wrote the story about Jesus and the disciples smoking mushrooms or whatever that was. I have it on my <laughs> shelf somewhere. But anyway, strange book. But anyway, so but he's a brilliant scholar, and he puts forth a solid argument that Shapira's manuscript is authentic. Mm -hmm. Most of the criticism in the 1800s, most of the reasons that they rejected or declared a forgery is internal character. I mean, uh, uh, they, they can't fathom that a leather document would su survive thousands of years. Mm -hmm. So they say that rules it out. Then you have other things. Why is it this dimension? We don't know of a scroll like this. Why does it have uh, vertical score marks to demark the columns, which aren't necessarily adhered to, but still, we wouldn't expect to see that in an ancient document. They go further. They say, not only that, but it's written in paleo. We don't have any example of paleo on Hebrew. Uh, not only that, we don't have any examples of continuous script broken mm -hmm. only by inner punks, nothing like this on leather. And why is it coated in asphalt or bitumen or pitch, this black sticky substance? And oh, by the way, why is there yeah. linen? Why yeah. is there linen on it? This is ridiculous. And in this story about a Bedouin finding it in a cave by the Dead Sea, you got to be oh, kidding me. Just, <laughs> come on, man. You, you so gotta obviously, be <laughs> come on, man. <laughs> so obviously all, uh, all of these are, uh, are confirmed by the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. 80 ancient. years I, later. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what? I, well. if Shapira or someone else fake this, they, they're they more than just a good forger. They, they've got a visionary like gift hmm. to see into the future. Hmm. Remember, if it was discovered in roughly 1865 in a cave by Bedouin, you know, uh, you know, not far from the Dead Sea in Wadi Mujib, high up in the cliffs in a cave. If, I mean, what are the chances, right, that mm. that story? In fact, and I point this out in the book, as many of you might know, but uh, when when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, one of the first things when they went to certain scholars and said, "Hey, we found some scrolls. We think they're ancient." They were found in a cave by some Bedouin, and people said, whoa, whoa not me, Hoss. You're not mm -hmm. getting me in on this because that sounds like the Shapira thing. Uh, yeah, it does, but I'm telling you, these are now, and when they now, so now when the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Qumran, let's call them uh, the Judean Wilderness Scrolls, because some of them mm -hmm. aren't found at Qumran, but the majority are. But if those scrolls, scrolls, proved to be authentic ancient documents and they look just like these others and in in many ways uh seem like they're very close in a lot of details it deserves a second look is what mm -hmm. these scholars would at least say but some scholars the again the easy out is just to say this it's fake mm. And you, and you go, well, well, on what basis do you call it fake? And they say, well, first of all, it doesn't matter. Some of them say this. It doesn't matter because we don't have the manuscript. So, I mean, technically, they have a good point. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like a murder case and you don't have a body. You know, you're like, well, I mean, I've got some circumstantial evidence here and it's pretty strong. We sure. can tell something happened here and we can't find Billy. You know, we think... So so you, you have to look at the story and you go, huh. But, uh, but other scholars are doing what they can to either validate it or once and for all squash it. I have some people that I highly respect. Uh, Matthew Rochelle is, in my opinion, uh, top bar. I mean, this guy's brilliant. Uh, mm -hmm. He does not think it's authentic, but and he's using his particular skill sets to uh, to look at exactly. the evidence in in his field, 
Yeah. And and he's come up with some good arguments. And I've, I've got to have answers for some of those things. There are others who just want to be the Claremont day, uh, Claremont Gano of today, I think. And I won't name those. Uh, but I think some of them really just uh, they want to be the guy that I mean, look, it's it's not a big deal now. But you let us find those fragments if they test and prove to be ancient, authentic manuscripts, it's a whole new game then, baby, mm. you know? Mm. Uh, but right now, they've got a safe uh, safe way to say, hey, it's fake. Because yeah. we don't have them. Um, but hopefully, it's just a matter of time. While, while Because we've been, we've been uh, chatting now for uh, a bit over an hour and a half. And yep. uh, last week when we did this, we had a whole lot of people come on and say good day. And I'm just curious if there are people listening um, because we're recording this live, and um, so can you uh, see the chat? Can you see the chat? I'm looking at the chat. Is is there? Uh, so I'm just saying, if there's anyone out there that's listening live, uh, flick I us see, a note. I see great. Marianne. Marianne's Mary come on and said a couple what of nice well. things for us. So hey, uh, Marianne, good to see you. Because we had a whole lot of people uh, last week as well. Uh, so just in case there are people listening to this live, if you have any questions uh, in regards to this or anything actually um by all means flick it to us because we're we're quite happy to to uh address those if you are watching live sure uh, just to put that there um so it, it and again it, it's not just the uh, uh the material evidences of the of the dead sea scrolls that concur with with uh, what we know about the uh, moses scroll but as we talked about last week too um the the latest find in regards to the concurrence of order uh, of um, uh, fruit of the womb, fruit of the land, fruit of the cattle, right? In uh, uh, a Dead Sea Scroll Q four twenty nine that concurs with the, the order that is represented in uh, the Moses Scroll, uh, something that appears in uh, Deuteronomy chapter thirty verse nine, and, and in also Deuteronomy in seven, seven verse thirteen. Um, so we have some uh, textual uh, overlap as well that that. No one would have known about, obviously, in yeah. uh, in 1870, 1880, wasn't discovered until you know 46, 47. So uh, 1946, 47, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. So there's that in favour too. And as we mentioned last week, the the evidence for uh, the Moses Scroll is stacking and stacking. And uh, uh, yeah. and as I mentioned, I think it's I would say it's an uphill battle now to try and maintain the position overall that uh, that it's not an authentic document you and i certainly believe that it is uh and um hence the reason why we're uh going on about this in 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 detail marian said uh i bet that many didn't know that you were live <laughs> yeah no that we yeah, that's they, true we we didn't we, announce right uh, that we were doing this so we we just um we, we've been uh, ross actually has been playing with this uh software and uh just to get it you know, perfect so that we didn't have any sound issues or anything like that. But we do intend to do this more often because uh, it's it's more engaging, you know, to be able what, to watch What about it. this, Jono? Maybe we can do this live. Uh, DC says, uh, we'll watch the recording. I was late. Uh, thank you, DC. One of the things that, that, I think, uh, that I think we might be able to do, people tend to respond to, you know, if you have a set time. So we just spur of the moment. I mean, we had this plan, yeah, but we, we didn't, didn't announce it. it. To Mary Ann's point, we didn't announce anything. Yeah. Uh, but what if what if we decided Thursday nights, 8 p.m. Central Time, uh, which is what we did tonight, a little after 8, but if we mm -hmm. sort of planned on 8 p.m. Thursday nights Central Time, you know, that that's a pretty reasonable time in the evening. Most people are off of work, even on the West Coast, unless they mm. maybe, you know, I don't know, maybe they work a little different hours. But uh, but on, on the East Coast, it would be 9 p.m. So uh, in, in the U.S., that's I think that's a pretty good time. So Thursdays work for me if they work for you, Jonah. And it works here. Yeah. So Friday morning works for me. Um, and the reason, the, like I just mentioned, one of the reasons why we want to do it on this particular platform is that it opens the opportunity for people who are watching live to ask questions in real time or to comment in real time. And we really appreciate that. Um, what we may end up doing maybe next week is uh, return to uh, the text of the Moses Scroll for those who have been 
keeping up to date on truth to you. Um, we have been going systematically through the Moses scroll and analyzing the text there. Uh, and we can return to that because we still have, uh, there's a few columns left, Ross. We're, we're yep. not all the way there yet. So we can finish that. Uh, but we can also address, you know, any well, questions. Or just just to, to that point, because some some people who listen to this may say, I don't I don't know anything about Moses scroll. I don't really care. I just want to talk about the Bible. What they don't realize, perhaps, is that everything we do is tied to the biblical text. By the way, that is the book there. <laughs> the book. But uh, but just so you know, so for instance, Jono, he studied this thing out that we talked about last week and he said, hey, look at Deuteronomy 30, verse 9. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 13. I mean, we, we're talking biblical text all the time. Hmm. So someone need not think, well, I don't know if I want to invest the time on something that's about something I don't know anything about. Well, first of all, you need to know something about this. But second off, uh, everything that we talk about is tied to questions related to the biblical text. Everything we do. And uh, thirdly, and well, to your point, uh, the vast majority of the Moses scroll is lifted and represented in the Pentateuch. It's it's, it's in the uh, the Torah as we have it in the Masoretic text. It, it's there for the most part. Uh, so you're already familiar with it. Um, you just, you know, we, we're, we're highlighting where it appears and yep. uh, and what it means that where it's the same, where it's different, what those differences mean. So uh, this is something that we're going to continue to get into and and we can chat about other things as well. So, yeah, so uh, uh, 8 p.m. Central Time, you said, on a Thursday evening. Yep. Uh, we're going to do this again. And uh, and I'm, I, I enjoy it. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Oh, I think this is great. I, I love this. Uh, you and I both uh, enjoy audio. And uh, so, but you, you kind of... You kind of drug us kicking and screaming into the 21st century, I guess, with this. But no, I'm pretty satisfied. I think that we've got some things lined out from a technical aspect and uh, I feel better about it. I am mm. I am scrolling a along the bottom now, Jonah, if you see about my mm. YouTube channel. We're going to put yeah. we're going to live stream when Jonah and I go live. We're going to do this to several different uh, outlets uh, I'm doing this to my Facebook, personal Facebook page. Jonah's doing it to his. I'm doing it to my uh, personal YouTube channel. And we've mm -hmm. got other other things. But I did want to announce, some of you may or may not listen in on Saturday mornings, but every Saturday morning uh, at 10.30 a.m. Central Time, I teach a class from the Pentateuch. And uh, this week's I'm really looking forward to talking about. I think... Uh, I'm calling the series The Pentateuch a New Look, and mm -hmm. we are really looking deeply into the text of the Pentateuch, and I found some things that uh, I'm very much looking forward to sharing this Saturday morning. Uh, we're going to be dealing with the text from the book of Numbers. We're in the book of Numbers from chapter 19 through uh, chapter 21, so I'm really going to focus on that, uh, particularly on a question dealing with the 40 years of wilderness wandering. So, right, right. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, that, that something pops into my head and it would start a whole new conversation, but we've probably gone on enough and maybe we yeah. can talk about that next week in regards to the uh, uh, the 40 year wandering or um, uh, how, how do we arrive at that figure? So that, that's an interesting question. So you're going to get into that uh, this Saturday morning uh, on United Israel. So, and uh, they can so they can find it on United Israel if they're not people who normally follow. But they can also find me on my YouTube channel, youtube.com, Ross K slash Ross K Nichols TV. And they can they can uh, find me on that as well. I'm going to stream live to my YouTube channel as well. Okay, so. okay grand. Uh, so lastly, uh, a lot of people over the uh, over the last couple of days have asked about the Tanakh tour. There is still yeah. room the Tanakh tour this coming November, uh, Tanakh tour of Israel. Uh, following on from that, because they're running back to back, is our Biblical Jordan tour. You, there, there is still some room there as well. So you have the opportunity still to join one or join the other um, uh, or join both. And there's a whole lot yeah. of people that are doing both uh, because they do run back to back. And uh, there was something else I was going to say about that, Ross. What was that? 
Um, no, it skipped my mind, but nevertheless, the information is available uh, on the screen there, tanaktours.com. Tanaktours.com will take you there and give you the details. Uh, oh, that's right. Patrick was asking me, uh, okay. does Israel does Israel require a vaccinated status um, to vaccines, so on and so forth? Nothing. Yep. So um, it was and, the case. And neither, does, neither does Jordan. Neither uh, does Jordan. Yeah. So uh, whatever your status is, uh, vaccinated, non-vaccinated, boosted, wh whatever, uh, Israel doesn't care anymore. Just, yeah. just turn up. It's fine. Um, all of that stuff has gone away as of the 20th of May, I think, this That's year. Right. When we arrived, uh, it was smooth sailing from, from uh, arriving in, uh, on our flight to getting through customers, uh, customs into the arrivals hall. Uh, no problem whatsoever. So yeah. don't be worried about that. No. Uh, is there anything else that we want to add in closing, Ross? No, I, I just want to underscore what you just said. I, I tell you, there is nothing that I like to do more than show people the land of Israel. And I know you feel mm -hmm. the same. Uh, we, we did have this time together in Israel and Jordan just last month. And it's, it's got me with the fever again. I can't wait to go back. I can't wait to bring a bus full of people. And uh, whether they go to Israel or Jordan or both mm -hmm. with us, TanakhTours.com. People can read about the uh, both of those tours and make their decision based on their personal preferences and means and so forth. But yeah, so Jono, I just want to encourage people to sign up and go with us. We have a wonderful time and we see plenty of wonderful sights. And mm -hmm. I don't know if I were them, I wouldn't want to miss it. <laughs> That's it. So get on to it because there are, as I mentioned, space available now. Uh, and you can secure that by placing a deposit by going to tanaktours.com. That is us. We will be back the same time next week. And until then, have a good one. Have a beautiful week.